Thank you. Thank you for joining me today. I'd like to share with you my analysis on Hamlet, in particular the events that happen in the latter part of Act Three. Okay, let me figure out my slides here. I gotta turn it on. Here we go, technical difficulties, okay. Uh, there already is a vast amount of literary analysis on Hamlet, much of which I find to be interpretations on interpretations. To clarify what I mean by that, if you imagine the old telephone game that we played, when you pass that message on to the next person, by the last person, that message is very unclear. And I have found that those interpretations or interpretations are so far away from the script. And I think it's time we go back to that. If I may be so bold, I think these interpretations are not what the playwright intended. Researching Shakespeare, especially researching Shakespeare from a progressive viewpoint, can be brutal and exhausting. In particular, the blasphemy that comes from the traditionalists who seem to believe authorship researchers must despise Shakespeare or his works. And as an unorthodox researcher, I find that the traditionalists have muddied the waters and we, this group, have a lot of cleaning up to do. The area I think needs attention is the plays. And I think it's time theater practitioners take control of them. Heretofore, the plays have been interpreted by literary scholars, but the plays were meant to be staged, to be seen by an audience, to be experienced in real time. They are not meant to be read at one's leisure. Of course, they can be read for leisure, but they weren't meant to be. Theater practitioners use specific tools to ferret a play down to its core, to drill it down to its essence. As a director, when I analyze a script, I search to find how the play moves, how it works, how it operates. I teach a course uh, on script analysis. A few of my students also take English drama courses. Oftentimes, there is a text overlap. Perhaps they have read Medea in the drama course, and I require it as well in script analysis. College students will often think, well, I've already read it. I don't have to reread it again. Well, that's not true. And so I will ask them, what did you learn about Medea in your drama course? Invariably, they will tell me they learned about tragic flaw and feminism, themes that surround the play. But I want them to see the action. Drama comes from the Greek word drawn, to do, to act. So I want the students, when they read Medea, I want them to see why characters do what they do. I want them to see how Medea seeks her revenge on Jason. And I want, I want them to see why she does what she does why she commits those acts. From there, they can elect on what the tragic flaw is. And, but to stage Medea, the tragic flaw doesn't matter at all unless we want our audience to snore throughout the entire live production. Thank you, appreciate that. Uh, in addition to Medea, I also teach Hamlet. And I have been working this play like it's clay in my hands. I've, I've stretched it and I've shaped it and I've looked at it in all these different angles. And what I have found is that my interpretation is against the traditional grain. Here is a synopsis I have found on the Folger website. I don't anticipate you to read all that. <laughs> but the area that I have most umbrage with is this one. Hamlet, now free to act, mistakenly kills Polonius, thinking he is Claudius. Thus, I'd like to share my process with you through the script analysis techniques I've used to draw these conclusions, that Hamlet could not have mistaken Polonius for Claudius, 
and that Hamlet knew it was Pilatius, he, st he Polonius, <laughs> he stabbed to death. First, I'd like to focus on the elephant in the room, not this room, Gertrude's chamber. After stabbing Polonius, Hamlet says, nay, I know not. Is it the king? Is it possible that Hamlet thinks he has stabbed the king? Modern interpretations would have us believe this is possible. But if we look closely at the play itself, this is not the case. Hamlet asks whether he has stabbed the king, not because he thinks it is the king. He knows it cannot be Claudius. He does it because he wants the act to look like an accident. The reason Hamlet knows it cannot be the king is because 35 lines prior, Hamlet was in the same room with Claudius, alone, while the, while the latter man was apparently praying. To refresh, the presentation of the murder of Gonzago has ended. The court is in a frenzy. The king was perturbed by the play's action. Hamlet discusses the king's behavior to Horatio. When Horatio leaves, Rosencrantz and Gildan, no, excuse me, Rosencrantz and Polonius inform Hamlet he's to visit his mother before going to bed. When Hamlet is finally alone, he says, now, tis now the very witching time of night when churchyards yawn and hell itself breaks out contagion to this world. Now could I drink hot blood and do such business as the bitter day would quake to look on. Soft, now to my mother. O oh, heart, lose not thy nature. Let not ever the soul of Nero enter this firm bosom. Let me be cruel, not unnatural. I will speak daggers to her, but use none. My tongue and soul in this be hypocrites. How in my words some other she be shent to give them seals never my soul consent. Hamlet, who is feeling quite hot at this juncture, knows he's capable of committing some dark act. Recognize that last line is a rhyming couplet. In literary analysis, rhyming couplets are believed to close or be a tidy button at the end of a scene, but in script analysis, they are much more important than that. Rhyming couplets rhyme so that they are obvious. The average Elizabethan was illiterate, but they were impeccable listeners. Rhyming couplets would have been electric to them. They would have been enticing, theatrical. In fact, rhyming couplets were the vogue among Elizabethan playwrights. Another focus, or another function of the rhyming couplet is that it acts like a foreword. So playwrights, playwrights sprinkle their plays with these devices called forewords to keep their audience attentive for two and a half hours. They keep them throughout the play to keep their audience wanting more. A rhyming couplet is one type of forward. Again, Hamlet's feeling incensed. He's so passionate, he has to calm himself so that he doesn't lash out at his mother. I will speak daggers to her, but use none. According to Cordo II, in modern text of the play, Hamlet exits the scene here. According to the first folio, there is no stage direction for Hamlet to exit. My theory is the folio is correct according to the contemporary staging practices. The Quarto II, first folio, and the modern text do include stage directions for Claudius, Rosencrantz, and Guildenstern to enter. At this time, G Claudius informs Rosencrantz and Guildenstern they are to prepare for England with Hamlet. They, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern leave, Polonius enters. He informs Claudius he's going to Gertrude's rooms to spy, hidden, to hear the dialogue with Hamlet, then he leaves. Alone, Claudius has time to pray and finds that he cannot. Now, Hamlet can kill his uncle, but he elects not to, because he thinks Claudius is praying and would be permitted passage to heaven, unlike his father, who is a wandering ghost. Instead, Hamlet decides, when he is drunk, asleep, or in his rage, or in the incestuous pleasure of his bed, at game a swearing, or about some act that has no relish of salvation in it, then trip him, that his heel, heels may kick at heaven, and that his soul may be as damned and black as hell, whereto it goes. My mother stays, this physic but prolongs thy sickly days. Hamlet determines 
The best time to kill Claudius is when Claudius is sinning. Hamlet vows to kill him when he's doing something that has no relish of salvation in it. Recognize that last line is also a rhyming couplet. Again, it is a foreword. Shakespeare is drawing our attention on what is going to happen. Hamlet says he's going to see his mother, and this issue with Claudius is postponed. He leaves. In the second quarto and the first folio, in modern text, there is a stage direction for Hamlet to exit. Claudius remains on stage. He says, my words fly up, my thoughts remain below. Words without thoughts never to heaven go. Recognize again, that is a rhyming couplet. In fact, here's the section from the second quarto. So why does Shakespeare use a double rhyming couplet? He uses them throughout the canon. This is the only one so far that I have found in Hamlet. Recall a rhyming couplet is meant to draw the audience's attention on what is going to happen. A double rhyming couplet is doubly conspicuous. The playwright wants his audience to notice something, but what? Thus far, I have reviewed events that took place in what we know are Act 3, Scenes 2, 3, and 4. However, the playwright didn't include the scene breaks. These were included or added by scholars in the 18th century when adjustments to the Elizabethan texts were made, including dropping the rhetorical language in favor of syntax and grammar, and they also uh, thereby lost their theatricality. Um, however, they were more readable. So if we look at the second quarto next to the Folger text, this 18th century reshaping of the quarto in folio certainly makes the play more manageable in terms of itemizing where action happens. However, it sets us up for some misconceptions too. For example, in an Elizabethan live production, there was very little to no scenery visibly seen on stage. So contemporary playwrights would include the scene changes in the language itself, um, or the scenery in the language itself. The contemporary audiences didn't experience scenery changes like we know them. And those of you who have ever directed a play know what a horrendous burden a scene change can be because they kill the pace of your show. I see you nodding. Thank you very much, Wally. Yes, he knows. So the analogy I like to use um, on how a play's pace should be is the carnival game horse raising. Um, it has that contestant where they, you know, shoot the water pistol, so their little, their little uh, horse and their jockey run across this uh, straight line. Uh, the game is resplendent with wonderfully energizing noises to start the race and end the race, and a plot kind of moves like this, this straight line, although Hamlet has more than one plot. It begins with a gong, moves through, along through this, st the, this uh, straight line, and then finishes, comes to a finish um, at, with a theatrical buzzing. But never in this carnival game did the jockey ever have to dismount his horse and change the scenery. So the issue with these, albeit convenient, but artificial, meaning the playwright didn't put the scene breaks there, causes the reader or the theater practitioner to assume there is a pause or a break in the action. Furthermore, some modern texts even include a location change, which again causes the reader or theater practitioner to imagine something must change. The script analysis text that I use most when teaching my students about this craft of understanding plays is called Backwards and Forwards by David Ball. Ball suggests that to fully grasp what the playwright intended, we must go back to the way in which it would have originally been staged. So let's imagine an Elizabethan theater. It's a thrust stage, uh, meaning there's, um, there's action on three sides of the stage. So um, the audience is on three sides of the, of the stage. It has um, a tearing house with a back facade wall for entrances. It, may, it usually con includes a balcony. It's simple, but it's incredibly effective. So let's dismiss the 18th century act scene divisions for a moment. Instead, look at Quarto II. Hamlet states, in his he states his rhyming couplet. He exits, number one. Claudius says his rhyming couplet exits as Gertrude and Polonius enter. The transition is fluid. There are no pauses. 
Polonius and Gertrude dialogue a mere seven lines when Hamlet enters. Part three, imagine the groundlings' reaction on step three. It's a close call. Is Polonius going to get behind that curtain, or is Hamlet going to see him? I think that would be pretty delightful to, to the groundlings, to the original audience. So this is why Hamlet could not mistake the hidden man to be Claudius. Hamlet just left him in another room. Modern interpreters have us believe Claudius could have gotten to the chamber first, or he knew a secret passage, or maybe Hamlet didn't go straight there, but there is little to no textual evidence to support those claims. So to recap, Shakespeare drew our attention by using rhyming couplets. Hamlet's line at the end of Act 3, Scene 2, and with a double rhyming couplet at the end of Act 3, Scene 3, which leads us into Act 3, Scene 4, where Polonius is stabbed. Shakespeare draws us in to pay attention. He's honing us in on the action. Remember, the energy at the end of the murder of Gonzago is frenzied. Hamlet is animated, and he's excited. He's pumped. Of course he's pumped. He succeeded in achieving a goal. The play's the thing, wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. The court is scrambling. Claudius is astounded. Gertrude is mystified by her son's behavior. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern continue to do the king and, king's bit, king and queen's bidding, and Polonius is in the center of the chaos. So if I may return to borrowing the 18th century act scene divisions, the events that occur in act three plateau at the end of the murder of Gonzago and steadily rise until Polonius is stabbed. Shakespeare has stacked the deck for us to focus, to hone in on Polonius's death. And I think he included the rhyming couplets to draw our attention to and not miss the subtlety of the moment. Claudius is not and cannot be in the chamber. After stabbing Polonius, Hamlet says, Thou wretched, rash, intruding fool, farewell. I took thee for thy better, take thy fortune. Thou findest to be too busy as some danger. Hamlet calls Polonius an intruding fool. That attribute of Polonius's character fits nicely with the interpretations on interpretations, but not the play itself. Who is Polonius? What does the script directly say about Polonius? Claudius tells Laertes in the entire court at the beginning of the play, the head is not more native to the heart, the hand more instrumental to the mouth, than is the throne of Denmark to thy father. Apparently, Polonius is the head and heart and hand and mouth to the throne of Denmark, and Claudius allows the entire court to hear that. Polonius is instrumental to the throne. Laertes informs Claudius he wants to return to France, having left only to attend Claudius's coronation. This detail is juxtaposed within the same scene when Horatio reveals he's in Denmark for King Hamlet's funeral, thereby revealing whose side Polonius and Laertes are on, King Claudius's. What a character says is not the only way to determine character. A more effective way to determine character using script analysis tools is to answer what a character does, why they commit those actions, what they want, what stands in the way of them getting what they want, and how far they're willing to go to achieve their goal. This is the essence of dramatic conflict. Want plus obstacle equals dramatic conflict. The tug of war between character want and the obstacle playing keep away is what makes it so exciting, so interesting, so enticing. Thus, to determine what a character, or to determine what Polonius's character, uh, who, or to determine Clonus's character, we must look at what he does throughout the play. And so I went through the script and I identified everything he does. This is beyond what a character says. Um, characters only speak because they want something, right? So this is actually what he does. I don't know if you can tell, but I have some um, bold here. Spied, spy, 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 spy. So he spies, we know this, right? So I want to uh, look at the area on Polonius' spying. 
Why is Polonius having Ophelia watched? Why does Shakespeare show us the scene with Polonius and Rinaldo? What does he want us to see? In the first part of the play, Ophelia is addressed by Laertes to be careful with Hamlet. He may not, as unvalued persons do, car for himself, for on his choice depends the safety and health of this whole state. Laertes urges Ophelia to guard herself because Hamlet is not free to choose his spouse because Hamlet is the prince. Polonius enters the same scene on the siblings. You'll recall this is when he gives his precepts to Laertes before he sets off for France. Shakespeare has Polonius also address Ophelia on the Hamlet matter, and he basically gives her a double lecture. He says, "'Tis told me he hath very oft of late given private time to you, and you yourself have of your audience been most free and bounteous. If it be so, as so tis put on me, and that in way of caution, I must tell you, you do not understand yourself so clearly as it behooves my daughter and your honor." Polonius admits he has had her followed. Tis told me, tis put on me, and that he and he also reprimands her for being free and bounteous in company with Hamlet. Polonius warns her that she forgets who her father is, and she also forgets her honor. At scene end, he expressly forbids her to see Hamlet anymore. After Hamlet hears the ghost's tale and swears his friends to secrecy, he admits. He visits, excuse me, he visits Ophelia and she in turn tells her father. Polonius determines Hamlet's odd behavior is because Polonius forbid Ophelia from seeing Hamlet. Polonius, thinking has the key to Hamlet's madness, takes this intelligence to the king and queen. Thus I surmise that Polonius wants to increase his prestige through King Claudius. Polonius is King Claudius' trusted advisor. Even Laertes came to witness Claudius' coronation, not King Hamlet's funeral. Claudius even stated to the entirety of court that Polonius is an instrument to the throne, and Polonius is a ruthless spy who even has the members of his household on surveillance. Polonius is willing to risk a great deal to get ahead. He puts his own neck, literally, on the line when he discloses the key to Hamlet's madness. Polonius also pawns his own daughter, first by jeopardizing her honor, and later he uses her to bait Hamlet. The typical interpretation of Polonius is a long-winded, senile, overbearing old man. Some interpretations mention the spy, whereas some suggest he provides comic relief. After seeing the ghost, Hamlet makes a quick decision to swear his friends to secrecy, even when he's acting strangely. He says, but come, here as before, never so help you mercy how strange or odd some more I bear myself, as perchance, I hear, as perchance hereafter I shall think meet to put an antic disposition on, that you at such time seeing me never shall with arms encumbered thus or this head shake, or by pronouncing of some doubtful phrase as well, well, no, or we couldn't if we would, or if we list to speak, or there be, and if there might, or such ambiguous giving out to note that you know aught of me. Literary criticism suggests that Hamlet is incapable of action or slow to make decisions. However, he makes this decision to feign madness rather quickly. He shows he's capable of making a quick decision after facing the supernatural ghost. Thus, it seems to me Hamlet has been witness to someone who shows two faces to satisfy their desires. Could Polonius have an antic disposition? Polonius says, my liege and madam, to expostulate what majesty should be, what duty is, why day is day, night, night, and time is time, were nothing but to waste night, day, and time. Therefore, brevity is the soul of wit, and tedious nims the limbs and outward flourishes. I will be brief. Your noble son is mad. Mad call I it, for to find true madness, what is it but to be nothing else but mad? But let that go. Queen says, more matter with less art. Polonius says, madam, I swear I use no art at all. Gertrude calls Polonius on his flummery, but he denies it. Although the queen has asked him to get to the point, Polonius does not. He says, Madam, I swear I use no art at all, but he's mad, tis true, tis true, tis pity, and pity, tis, tis true, a foolish figure, but farewell it, for I will use no art. 
Mad let us grant him then, and now remains that we find out the cause of this effect, or rather say the cause of this defect. For this effect, defective comes by cause. Prior to this scene, in the scene that's often cut from productions, what we now call act scene or act two, scene one, Polonius prepares Rinaldo for his mission to France, where Rinaldo is tasked with putting a blemish on Liarity's character. And if Rinaldo succeeds, Liarity's will confide in Rinaldo. When Polonius speaks to Rinaldo, he uses what I like to call his public persona, just like he used for Queen, uh, for Queen Gertrude. He says, and then, sir, Polonius says, and then, sir, does this, that, what was I about to say? By the mass, what was I about? I was about to say something. Where did I leave? Rinaldo, at closes in the consequence. Polonius, at closes in the consequence. I marry. He closes thus. I know the gentleman. I saw him yesterday or the other day, or then, or then, with such or such. And as you say, there was a gaming there, or took in's rouse. They are falling out of tennis, or perchance I saw him enter a house, such a house of sale. Videlis at a brothel, or so forth. See you now. Your bait of falsehood take this carp of truth, and thus we do of wisdom and reach with windlasses and with assays of bias by indirections find directions out. So by my former lecture and advice shall you, my son. Polonius as before is excessively wordy, as if he cannot find the words. He seems like he's losing his faculties, like his mind isn't what it once was. He acts senile. Polonius and I do think, or else this brain of mine hunts not the trail of policy so sure as it hath used to. When Rinaldo leaves, Ophelia immediately enters distress to tell her father about Hamlet's strange behavior. She tells Polonius that Hamlet, not groomed and partially dressed, had stared at her and grievously sobbed. Note Polonius switches in this same scene to his private persona that he reserves only for Claudius and his children. Polonius. Come go with me. I will go seek the king. This is the very ecstasy of love, whose violent properties fordoes itself and leads the will to desperate undertakings as oft as any passion under heaven that does afflict our natures. I am sorry. What, have you given him any hard words of late? Ophelia, no, my good lord, but as you did command, I did repel his letters and denied his access to me. Polonius, that hath made him mad. And I am sorry that with better heed and judgment I had not coded him. I feared he did but trifle and meant to rack thee, but beshrew my jealousy. By heaven, it is as proper to our age to cast beyond ourselves and our opinions as it is common for the younger sort to lack discretion. Come, go we to the king. When Polonius needs to be, he has all his faculties. He's sharp, he's pointed. Is he deliberately switching from one persona to another? When discussing the character Polonius, it should come as no surprise that I'm going to mention William Cecil, Lord Burley, since it has been suggested Cecil is the archetype for Polonius. Cecil, too, was noted for having two personas. His public persona was intricate and outspoken, whereas his private persona was more direct and urgent. Burley cleverly increased his prestige through the turbulent courts of three Tudor monarchs, even during times of war and religious strife. And it is here I'd like to draw further upon Burley and Polonius. Based on what Polonius does, I surmise Polonius wants to increase his prestige through King Claudius. What stands in his way is everything. His obstacle, thus, his, uh, what stands in his way is everything, his obstacle. Thus, he sends his spies to monitor. To increase his prestige, he is willing to pawn his daughter because he knows the king wants a solution to the Hamlet problem. If Hamlet is in love, perhaps Polonius can offer his daughter to wed. In the same scene, he reveals Polonius or Hamlet's madness to the king and queen. He also says, I have a daughter, have, while she is mine. Polonius and Hamlet have many parallels. Both act and know about the theater. Both use Ophelia as bait. One fakes senility, the other feigns madness, but both to gain information. Both have a tell when they switch faces. One is wordiness and flummery, whereas the other is, verse lang or is prose language. Furthermore, one spies, whereas the other observes. Since Act Two, Scene One, Hamlet has been several steps ahead of Polonius. 
resulting in the latter man's death. Looking again at the transition between Act 3, Scenes 2 and 3, Hamlet, according to the first folio, doesn't leave the scene. Instead, he observes Claudius's dialogues, first with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, and then Polonius. While observing, Hamlet learns Claudius is sending Hamlet to England, a fact Hamlet mentions to his mother in Act 3, Scene 4. Hamlet also hears Polonius will be hiding in Gertrude's chamber to spy on the conversation with Hamlet. Hamlet knows Polonius will be there. He knows Polonius will be hiding. Okay, so what are the implications that Hamlet purposely killed Polonius? If we operate on the standard Polonius characterization of senile old fool, well, then Hamlet looks like a real lunatic. However, the standard Polonius characterization has missed the target on the character. Look at what Polonius does, not what he says. And if you're going to look at what he says, then look at why he says it the way he says it. And we find that Polonius is a cunning, cunning statesman looking to increase his prestige through the king. Would Claudius keep a dotering old buffoon as his primary counselor? Claudius, who wants to keep his queen and throne and with the same fervor as Macbeth? Structurally, Polonius has to die. There are three, avenging, there are three sons avenging their father's deaths. Fortinbras overarchs the plot. Hamlet drives through the plot, and then Laertes concludes the plot. There's another interesting parallel. Fortinbras invades Poland. Captain, we go to gain a little patch of ground that hath in it no profit but the name. Whereas Hamlet kills Polonius, whose name is derived from Polonia or Poland. With Edward of Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford, as the writer, one can readily see how he and Anne Cecil were pawned by William Cecil. I see Oxford as both Hamlet and Fortinbras. As Hamlet, he disposes those who controlled his life. As Fortinbras, he reclaims his birthright, his lands. What Oxford couldn't do in real life, he was able to do on stage. For Hamlet, according to script analysis, he needed to kill Polonius because Polonius was in his way. Hamlet had to pass him in order to get to the king. I think Oxford must have felt something akin for emotion for Polonius because he chose for Hamlet to kill him blind. Traditional analysis claims Hamlet killed Polonius mistaking him for Claudius, but this is poor interpretation. Script analysis techniques reveal Hamlet knew Polonius was behind the auras and not Claudius, thereby ending Polonius's ambitious prestige. Thank you. <laughs>